Welcome, brothers and sisters. And uh, we are glad for the Sabbath of the Lord. We welcome you into this uh, midday program. And uh, we appreciate for the morning service. And as we enter into the next program, we just pray the presence of the Lord may be with us and guide us in the whole session. I'd like to welcome uh, Brother Brian for a song before we begin the presentation. Welcome, Brother Brian. Uh, I don't know if you people can hear as well because my computer actually has very low volume. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, Brian. Can you hear us? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. <clears throat> so, so, so it is uh, song number 603. We have been learning some new songs and we realized that the hymnal, corrupted though it is, has some very wonderful songs. So this is one of them, <clears throat> 603. Thank you, Brother Brian, for the song, and uh, we praise the Lord for it. Um, we have been running the series on justification by faith, and uh, I have been looking at it from the uh, historical standpoint of 1888 messages. And uh, today I'd like to bring out uh, something in connection with that as we continue with the nature of Christ. And today's presentation is, uh, as you can see on the screen, Minneapolis 1888 and the aftermath, his humanity, why does it matter? I'd like us to pray and then uh, begin uh, our presentation. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the Sabbath. 
thy holy Sabbath, Lord. And as we learn of thee and from thee, may you impress the things we learn in our minds, Lord, and uh, make them of an effect in our lives that we may practice them for the glory and honor of thy name. Abide with us as we study this lesson. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so the, the issue of uh, Minneapolis and what happened in the aftermath of it continues to be a teaching in Adventism that uh, many would like to look into. Sometimes it eludes people, but uh, we glorify the Lord because he's uh, continuing to reveal himself unto us. And not only that uh, we may have Uh, a theoretical, uh, not only that we may have a theoretical information, but uh, we may have uh, a practical knowledge of uh, the truth that uh, Christ is teaching us through his uh, word. And so for the lovers of history, welcome. And uh, as uh, I began the presentation on the nature of Jesus Christ, I said that uh, I'll be taking E.G. White's quotes as a historical truth that uh, God has given unto us and also as inspiration, divinely truth that have application in our life to shape our character and to mold us so that we may be fitted for the kingdom of God. So without much uh, ado, I'll just go to share my screen so that we may be benefited together as uh, I go through uh, this uh, presentation of Minneapolis 1888 and the aftermath. His humanity, the humanity of Jesus Christ. Why does it matter? Uh, we saw last uh, Sabbath that uh, the humanity of the son of God is everything to us. Many people ask, why, do we, why are we so concerned with the humanity of Jesus Christ? Why, that, why does this uh, thing really concern us? Why, why are we so engrossed in it and why do we make noise about it? We do not make noise about it. We are told it is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is, this is to be our study. And so it is not something that we are prodding into and we have, not, we, we have been told that we shouldn't. It is something that we have been told we should study about it. Christ was a real man. He gave a proof of his humility in becoming a man, yet he was God in the flesh. When we approach this subject, we will do well to hear the words spoken by Christ to Moses at the burning bush. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place where on thou standest is a holy ground. We should come to this study with the humility of a learner, with the uncontrite heart, and the study of the incarnation of Christ is a fruitful study which will repay the searcher who digs deep for hidden truth. So it is not mere conjectures, it is not mere um, speculations or desire to know of the things that pertain to the human nature of Jesus Christ, but uh, as we approach the study, we approach it so that we may be benefited and uh, find the deep truth that concern our salvation. So, some have wondered if understanding why Jesus came as a babe, as men and women come into this world really matters. They say that uh, a farm along the Nile in Egypt or a young man in Sudan or a young woman in college have greater things on their mind than getting into straight about Christ's humanity as long as they know that Jesus died for them. So there are people who say that this doesn't matter to them. A boy in Egypt, why will he matter about the humanity of Jesus Christ? These are the, some of the things. This is from a... Uh, uh, a Fork in the Road, a book written by Doug Butler, uh, Doug, uh, Herbert Douglas, page 11. And uh, does this really matter? We are told in Desire of Ages, page 48, paragraph 5. 
The story of Bethlehem is an exhaustless theme. In it is hidden the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. So the humanity of Jesus Christ, in it is hidden the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom, knowledge of God. And we know we are told in the book of James chapter one, verse five, if anyone lacketh wisdom, let him ask of God and he'll give him without upbraiding, he giveth liberally. And one of the subjects that we can study and get the riches of both wisdom and knowledge of God is the humanity of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. We marvel at the savior sacrifice in exchanging the throne of heaven for the manger and the companionship of adoring angels for the beasts of the store. Human pride and self-sufficiency stand rebuked in his presence. Yet this was no, this was but the beginning of his wonderful condemnation. The, that Christ becoming a human being was the beginning of his wonderful condemnation. And for what profit that he may fulfill all righteousness that man may be justified. It will have been an almost infinite humiliation for the son of God to take man's nature even when Adam stood in his innocence in Eden, which means that Christ did not take the nature of Adam when he stood in innocence in Eden. But Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by earth, weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. What is heredity? Partaking of what your parents are. In Jesus partook what Mary had. What these results were shown in the history of these of earthly ancestors. He came with a, such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptation and to give us the example of a sinless life. So by Jesus Christ taking upon humanity, his main reason was to show us an example that actually sin can be overcome. And so the study of his humanity is so important because if we don't understand it, we will have a false conception of victory over sin. And this is where, uh, this is the most important theme in justification, victory over sin, victory over sin. We read on that uh, the Lord Jesus came to our world and it was not to reveal what God could do, but what a man could do through faith in God's power to help in every emergency. Now, I, I, I like you to think about the import of this statement in 3SM 140 paragraph 2, that he did not come to reveal what God can do. If he did not come to reveal what God can do, then surely he did not come uh, clothed as God. He came as a man because what will it, uh, if we say that, uh, uh, if we say that he came as God, then what will be the essence of the quote that he came to show what man can do, not what can, God can do. And that is why we are told in Philippians that he humbled, he who was in the form of God, humbled himself in the form of a servant. And so for what reason, the quote tells us, 3SM, uh, page 140, paragraph two. He did not come to reveal what God could do. This is not the issue that Christ came to reveal in the world. And that is why we say that he did not partake the nature of angels, the divine nature. He partook of the sinful nature. Why? He came to reveal what men can do through faith in God's power to help in every emergency. So you can, from this quote, you can find that Christ came in the nature of man, not in the nature of God. He left his glory. Man is through faith to be a partaker in the divine nature and to overcome every temptation wherewith he is beset. The Lord has, the Lord now demands that every son and daughter of Adam through faith in Jesus Christ serve him in the, in the human nature, which we now have. If he were able to serve his father in the nature that he had also as by taking partaking of his divine nature, we can serve God through faith in the nature that we have. And so when a man is converted, he, his nature is not changed per se. What is done actually is that uh, uh, his uh, conscience is renewed. The dormant faculties are uh, 
are revived again to the will of God. The Savior took upon himself the infirmities of humanity and lived a sinless life that men might have no fear that because of the weakness of human nature, they could not overcome. So Christ came with the infirmities of the, that besets the human nature. He came with all that weakness so that he may overcome and man may have his example that also he can overcome. Christ came to make us partakers of the divine nature and his life declares that humanity combined with divinity does not commit sin. This is the really gist in the issue of justification and the nature of Jesus Christ. The great grand work of bringing out a people who will have a Christ-like characters and who will be able to stand in the day of the Lord is to be accomplished. And whom do we look at? You can see at the picture that uh, actually Christ is our example and he leads the way and he holds our hand and we follow it. And as we follow Jesus Christ, as we continue beholding them, we are changed into the same uh, glory, in the same glory that he had. Our lives are vivified. Our character are transformed. And we, as we behold him, we just become like him. And so Jesus Christ came as a man and understands the infirmities that uh, the human race, the, the, the fallen man actually goes through. And so we are told that uh, he who seeks to transform humanity must himself understand humanity. Remember, we are asking the humanity of Jesus Christ. Is it, does it matter? Is it important unto us in the issues to do with justification? Is, are, are these things important to us? And in the book of education, we are told that he who seeks to transform humanity must himself understand humanity. How could he understand humanity? We, we are told in the book of Hebrews chapter five that uh, uh, he took upon himself humanity and learned obedience. Even as children learn obedience, he himself had to learn obedience. And after overcoming, he became the author. Uh, uh, he, uh, after being made perfect, he became the author of eternal life. So he partook of the humanity and then overcame sin. And now he is able to be the author of eternal life. In the book of Luke, we are told that uh, he grew in stature in wisdom, in favor of God and in favor of man, meaning that Christ grew as even other children grow, grows. And his life in a, is an example to the little children so that they may be like Jesus Christ. They may be able to go the ways of uh, uh, holiness and righteousness. To the adults, he is an adult. When he became uh, a grown up man, he lived a, a life of uh, severity. He was uh, encompassed with the same problems that uh, men are encompassed with and he is able to succor all that come to him. And so uh, the only safety now is to search for the truth as revealed in the word of God as for the hidden treasure. And why should we search for the truth? Uh, it is because it is because that uh, truth sanctifies, error does not sanctify. We cannot be sanctified by um, holding onto erroneous doctrine. We cannot be sanctified by following the path of unrighteousness. If we have error in our lives, they will mold us and uh, uh, guide even how we make decisions in our lives. But if we have the right conception of who Christ is, of who God is, then we will be able to do uh, uh, the, the right thing. We will be able to do the right thing and will be able to be guided into the right principles. So we may we, we must have truth about the Sabbath, the nature of man, and the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is the, the, the subject that uh, should, stir, should uh, stir our hearts, that should stir our minds to look into them. The subjects of the Sabbath, the nature of man, and the testimony of Jesus. And why the nature of man? Because we are told that when God created man, he created him in his own likeness and image, and man is a specimen of Jehovah. And so if we are a specimen of Jehovah, we, we have to ask ourselves, 
how is God uh, and how is our lives? And then in Christ, find the power that we may be missing to overcome sin. These are the great important truths to be understood. This will prove as an anchor to hold God's people in this perilous time. So the study of the human nature of Jesus Christ is one of the subjects that will prove an anchor to hold to God's people in this last perilous time. And uh, just thinking about uh, this humanity of Jesus Christ being an anchor that um, will hold us during the perilous time. We know that the perilous time are before us, the great time of temptation, where actually the character of every man shall be revealed. And by studying the humanity of Jesus Christ, we find how he, he overcame during even in a crisis. Remember when he was in the garden of Gethsemane and he was saying that, oh Lord, if this cup can be taken away, take it away, but not according to my will, but according to your will. Indeed, the, uh, uh, the flesh is weak, but the spirit helps in overcoming this. And so when we are brought to the great temptations in this perilous time that we are going to face, we can look unto Jesus Christ, who is the author and finisher of our faith and say, if he was able to go through, then we don't have an excuse of sinning because we are human and we are born with a, sinle a sinful nature, uh, a nature which is weak. Christ was born with the same nature. And when he was uh, uh, brought into great straits, he was able to overcome. And so no child of Adam needs to give an excuse why he have to sin because he has the, huma, the sinful uh, human nature. And so we are told that um, the humanity of the son of God is everything to us. It is the golden link chain. It's the golden link chain which binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. Christ was a real man and he gave proof of his humility in becoming a man and he was God in the flesh. When we approach the subject of Christ's divinity clothed with the garb of humanity, we may appropriately heed the words spoken by Christ to Moses at the burning bush, put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place where on thou standest is a holy uh, ground. We must come to the subject, uh, to the study of this subject with humility of a learner, with a contrite heart, and the study of the incarnation of the of Christ is a fruitful field and will repay the searcher who digs deep for the hidden treasure. Seventh day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 904 and 905. And so when you go to our Adventist history, the pioneers made between 1852 to 1952, they made 1,200 statements of the fallen human nature of uh, Jesus Christ. This is the real true history of how Adventism was birthed and uh, came to formulate the, uh, the principles that guides this church. And then from E.G. White, that is at that, uh, in, the, in the period of 1852 uh, to 1952, she made 400 statements about the fallen human nature of Jesus Christ. Take, that is, uh, that is, um, from 1852 to 1952, a total of uh, 1,800 statements are made about the fallen nature of Jesus, the fallen human nature of Jesus Christ. But uh, Satan has been uh, against this doctrine so much. And why is Satan against this doctrine of the human nature of Jesus Christ? because you are studying the issues to do with justification and the human nature of Jesus Christ. Why is this study so important? Why does it matter? And why does Satan hate it so much? We read, we have following statements to consider. God was, uh, these are the charges, uh, and uh, uh, just go back to this screen. Satan has made some charges against God. And this has to do with the human nature of Jesus Christ. But why is he making these charges? Let us see. God was unfair to make laws that created beings could not keep. 
you hear what the charges of Satan are because you're studying the human nature of Jesus Christ. Satan has something against the government of God that God was unfair to make laws that created beings could not keep. And so the charge of Satan is that God has these laws which humanity or the beings that were created cannot keep. This is Christ object lesson page 314. And then God demanded a self-denial and sacrifice from his created beings, but will not himself exercise such unselfishness toward his created beings, patriarchs and prophets, page 70 and 1 SM 341. And so these are the matters that really help us to understand why the human nature of Jesus Christ is so important. It is to vindicate the character of God. It is to give men justification by believing that the Lord will do what he has promised he will do. Help them overcome and be able to be obedient to the law of God. When uh, we study about uh, the third angel's message, the third angel's message is about righteousness by faith and righteousness by works. And it's about receiving the seal of God and receiving the mark of the beast. And the, the heart of the last message, which is justification by faith, is laying the glory of man in dust and God enabling man to do what he cannot do on his own power, but through faith in Jesus Christ to be able to do it. Being obedient, being justified, so that they may be given even the strength to obey all his commandments. So the real issue in the humanity of Jesus Christ and justification by faith is Satan is claiming that man cannot have victory over sin or man cannot keep the law of God. And so the humanity of Jesus Christ is so important because it will reveal unto us if really man in his fallen nature can be able to keep the commandments of God. God was severe. These are the charges of Satan. God was severe, exacting, and harsh. God was the author of sin and suffering and death. These are the matters that now Jesus, when he comes in the nature of man, comes to actually uh, 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 do what? Be able to refute. If God were fair and good, he will never have permitted created beings to transgress his law. You see, Satan uh, takes man into strangulation and then he claims that it is God who has permitted him uh, this to happen. God made faulty laws and that for the good of the universe, those laws should be changed. So the issue is victory over sin. Man cannot overcome sin. Uh, this is the issues that Satan has to do. And Christ comes in the human nature to reveal that actually man can keep uh, his commandments. When man sinned, all heaven was filled with sorrow, out of harmony with the nature of God, and yielding to the claims of his law. Not, but destruction was before the human race. Since the divine law is as changeless as the character of God, there could be no hope for man unless some way could be devised whereby his transgression may be pardoned, his nature renewed, and his spirit restored to reflect the image of God. Divine love had conceived such a plan. I'll take you back at the accusations of Satan that man cannot keep the law, that the created being cannot keep the law of God. When you think about this matter out, you find that uh, Satan is charging God with sin of, of creating heavenly beings the way they are cre created, which really narrows down to our nature is sin. The nature of created beings is sin. Because if God created beings, then put there a law that they cannot really be able to keep, then our nature in itself is sin. If Satan is charging God with the nature of man being not able to overcome sin, then the nature itself the way it was created, it was created weak and not be able to overcome. And this is sin that God has committed. And so the charges of Satan, sometimes when people look at these things at uh, uh, a surface value, they do not see the really great controversy involved in righteousness by faith and justification by faith and also the humanity of Jesus Christ. 
it narrows down to certain charging the government of God with faultiness. Certain charges the government of God with things that God have not done. And so it is God on trial. It doesn't matter what we are going through. It is God here on trial and not man per se. Man is on trial in a secondary sense, but primarily the person who is uh, uh, on trial is God himself and his government. And God decides to send his son so to demonstrate that his principles are principles of righteousness. So in the work of creation, Christ was with God. He was one with God, equal with him. He alone, the creator of man, could be his savior. No angel of heaven could reveal the father to the sinner and win him back to the allegiance to God. But Christ could manifest the father's love for God has in Christ. For God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. This is uh, that I may know him, page 18, paragraph 4. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him must not perish but have everlasting life. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we are told that uh, for God was in Christ reconciling uh, the world unto himself. So Satan ha has here charged the government of God with uh, being a, a, a government that uh, has created subjects which and then put their laws which they cannot keep. And so because Christ is the creator of the human race, because Christ is the God of the human race, he condescends himself to the very nature and not only the very nature, but the lowest of it after it had been ruined with 4,000 of sin, he uh, takes the lowest position he can take to reveal that his government is a righteous government that really he has not asked his subject to do something he himself cannot do. This is the whole issue of the great controversy being played in uh, our eyes. Said the angel, think you that the father yielded up his dearly beloved son without a struggle. No, no, it was even a struggle with the God of heaven whether to let guilty man perish or to give his darling son to die for them. Angels who are so interested for man's salvation that they could be found among them those who would yield their glory and give their life for perishing man. But Satan was just waiting for this opportunity to say that now you are sacrificing the subjects of your kingdom for the salvation of others. And so Christ, instead of allowing the angel to come down and die for man, he comes himself. So he comes to tread the paths of this earth to walk the narrow path, to walk the life of struggle. He who was in the nature of God, in the form of God, now is made and Christ is created, his humanity is created. And he comes to this earth to demonstrate actually the plan of redemption. But the plan of redemption had yet a greater and broader, deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. Heaven itself had been in peril. The earth itself had been in peril. The fallen worlds were waiting to see what action God will take. And so it was not just for merely saving man of a, a sin problem, this little planet, but the whole universe, the fallen and the unfallen world were watching the whole plan of redemption and why God created man the way he created him. This is PP, page 68. How will the charge against God be answered? This is the whole issue then. Christ came to represent the Father. We behold in him the image of the invisible God. He clothed his divinity with humanity and came to the world that the erroneous idea certain had been, the means of creating in the minds of men in regard to the character of God might be removed. Signs of the time, January 20, 1890, paragraph 5. And so Christ partaking of the humanity, it's an answer against the charges that Satan has made against the government of God. God here is on trial. 
that we can really overcome uh, inequity. Christ came to give the world an example of what perfect humanity might be when united with divinity. He presented to the world a new face of greatness in his exhibition of mercy, compassion, and love. He gave to men a new interpretation of God. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 260. Men, the earth had been filled with the erroneous ideas about God. The earth had a miscomprehension of the character of God, and they needed to be directed back to the attributes of God which had been marred by Satan by tempting man to fall in the Garden of Eden. And so for that character to be vindicated, now God has to send his own son. God will sacrifice everything for humanity. And this is exactly what is the principle of his government, sacrifice. The dying of self for the benefit of others. In fact, we find that when Christ, we saw last Sabbath that uh, when Christ took upon humanity, he imperiled heaven itself by taking uh, a risk of eternal loss. Satan, the fallen angel, had declared that no man could keep God's law, and he pointed to the disobedience of Adam as proving the declaration true. Signs of the Time, April 10, 1893, Truth About Angels, page 58, paragraph 3. This is what Saturn had caused people to believe in. In all those uh, 4,000 years of sin in this world, the very charge of Saturn was that God had created humanity. But in the humanity God that has created him, man cannot be able to obey the principles of his government. And so the nature of man itself was the problem and the law of God. The principles of the government of God and the nature which he has created man with is the problem. These are the charges that had to be answered. And that is why we are told that when we venture into studying the human nature of Jesus Christ, the study is fruitful to the researcher because in it lies riches and it's a golden link that binds us together to God through Jesus Christ. We are told Satan had made the boast that he would gather the world under his banner of rebellion. He declared that man could not keep the law of God. Christ came to prove this assertion false. Do you see why the nature of Jesus Christ is so important to the charges of Satan? And really, if we get the, if, if, if we get the nature of uh, Jesus Christ wrong, then in simple terms, what we will be doing, we will be proving that the charges that Satan had against God are true. And that is why to hold any erroneous ideas about the nature of Jesus Christ, his divinity or his humanity, is really to support or to strengthen the kingdom of Satan himself. That is why in the introduction we saw that uh, uh, when we approach this subject, we should approach it with humility, with a mind of a learner, and heed to the word spoken to Moses, this is a holy ground, take off the shoes. Because in it, the line, the, the track of truth and the track of lies lies almost together and in semblance, they resemble. And they cannot be differentiated but by the designer of the truth, which is the spirit of God. And it is only by partaking of him that we have this spirit of discerning what is truth and what is error. And then we will be able to represent the government of God in a righteous way, in a correct way, than to represent it with the ideas and the charges that Satan had against him. Signs of the Time, August 9, 1905, paragraph 9. Christ words, Satan has declared that man cannot keep the law, the law. I'll show that his statement is false, that man can keep the law. Beautiful, uh, 18 manuscript releases, page 133, paragraph three. We are ever to be thankful that Jesus has proved to us by actual life that man can keep the commandments of God. So in 
In the humanity of Jesus Christ lies victory over sin, contradicting Satan's falsehood that man cannot keep them. Science of the Time, April 17, 1893, paragraph 3. Satan declared that it was impossible for the sons and daughters of Adam to keep the law of God and thus charge upon God a lack of wisdom and love. Brothers and sisters, you think about that, that God has no wisdom and God has no love. If they could not keep the law, then there was the fault with the lawgiver that make any fault in God makes God a sinner. And that is why Satan says that his government will be a better government than the government of God. And in the, you know, something that you have to understand about um, the government of, of Satan, it is a government which is ruled by the principle, do what thou will. That is the principle. Read about um, uh, this Luciferian and Satanist, Satanists. The principle that they use for what they do, do what thou will, is the rule in the kingdom of Satan. They do not want any restraint. They do not want any uh, rule to control them, but to be free. Yes, and that is it. God created us with a free will, but a free will to choose what we will do. And he has chosen in his kingdom to be ruled with righteousness for people to be righteous, not to run riot, not to do anything they want that will hurt the other person. The love of the neighbor and the love of God has to be the supreme principle that uh, accentuates what we do. But in the kingdom of Satan, these are not the rules. Thank you so much, Brother Junior Sirungu. And so uh, God's government is a government that is ruled with the principles of righteousness, not do what thou will, which actually you have to hurt feelings and do whatever you want and you don't care about how people will feel. And so Satan is seeking to bring a government that is chaotic, where actually no one has boundaries on what they are doing, but God through love. In fact, God does not restrict us to do the things we want. What God wants us to do is when, whenever you want to do what you want to do, think about your neighbor, think about how they feel, think about the people who are beside you. Your actions do not end with you alone. Your actions actually shape the people around you. And how are they shaping them? This should be a question that we should ask ourselves, even as we look at the principles of love that uh, uh, actually rules the government of God. And so uh, men who are under the control of Satan repeat these accusations against God in asserting that man cannot keep the law of God. And whenever we keep sinning, whenever we keep continuing in rebellion, we support the government of Satan. Science of the time, January 16, 1896, paragraph two. Jesus himself humbled himself, clothing his, his divinity with humanity in order that he might stand as the head and representative of the human family. And by both precept and example, condemn sin in the flesh and give the lie to Satan's charges. Bible Echo, December 1, 1893, paragraph four. Divinity and humanity were mysteriously combined and man and God became one. It is in this union that we find the hope of our fallen race. Amen. God could not save man as God. He had to send his own son to humble himself to the level of humanity and not use his divinity, but hold on the hand of the omnipotence by faith. And Jesus bears record that I came not to do my will, but my father's will. And also we can declare this to Satan. We, know, we do not live to do our own will, but we do the will of the Father who created us. In fact, one thing that should make us not yield to these deceptions of Satan is that God is the creator. He is our creator and he is our father. And no child lives for himself. Every child lives to please their parents to be obedient to their parents. 
but Satan here is a created being, but he doesn't want to acknowledge his parent who is our heavenly father. And he wants to sweep us into the same line. You see what Satan is doing is bringing this notion even in children that you do not have to obey your parents. And that is why Satan is charged with sin and sin is the transgression of the law. We shall be looking at it in the afternoon. That uh, when a child is born, it doesn't matter what is the will of the parent. It doesn't matter if it is good or bad. The child has to grow the way it wants. This is how Satan wants even to break family ties. He wants to destroy the government of God. But God created humanity so that they may actually be obedient to their parent who is the heavenly father. And by being obedient to our heavenly father, we can also impart the same obedience unto our children and help them learn obedience to their earthly parents. But if we run riot against the government of God, how will we expect our own children even to obey us? It will be so hard. And so you find how the government of Satan really actually affect every sphere of human life. It is hidden in uh, many deceptions. We are told, though he had no taint of sin upon his character, yet he condescends to connect a fallen nature, human nature with his divinity. By thus taking humanity, he honored humanity. Having taken a fallen nature, he showed what it might become by accepting the humble provision he has made for it and be, be, by becoming partake of the divine nature. PSM 134.2. The book of John chapter one, verse, verses one to three to 14. In summary, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth and you can partake of the same. And so Jesus' nature, or Jesus Christ had two natures in him, Christ divine, the divinity was not humanized, the divine was not humanized and the human was not uh, uh, made divine. And so 100%, 100%, this is the equals where inspiration reveals. The divine nature of Jesus Christ was immortal and could not die the human nature was mortal and could die. This is the risk of eternal loss. And so Christ as God could not save us. Christ has to partake of the same that humanity partakes to save us. He must taste death for humanity. And if he didn't have humanity, then his coming was only pretentious. As a member of human family, he was mortal, but as God, he was the fountain of life for the, to the world. He could, in his divine person, ever have withstood the advantage of death and refused to come under his dominion. But he voluntarily laid down his life that in so doing, he must give life and bring immortality to light. If Christ could have come as God and not die, then we will not have immortality. What humanity was this? It amassed angels. The tongue can never describe it. The imagination cannot take it in. The eternal word consented to be made flesh. God became man. And for what reason? So that uh, he can withstand the trials of this life, test death for humanity, and make man lay hold of immortality. Why? is the human nature of Jesus Christ so important? It leads us into partaking of the immortality. Jesus Christ, two natures, Christ divinity, we have seen. Immortal cannot die, is sinless nature. Christ humanity, it's mortal, died at Calvary and is a fallen sinful nature. He took upon his sinless nature, our sinful nature, that he might know how to succor those that are tempted, medical ministry, page 181. Christ could not know what human beings go through if he came as God. He could not know what it means to be tempted from within and from without if he did not take of the human nature. 
And so it was behooving that he partakes of the same so that he may test what humanity tests and then overcome and be able to show humanity that really your nature, however much is humanity, it is not a weakness, but there lies strength when you behold on the hand of omnipotence. Christ in full, fallen flesh, fallen nature, human nature, sinful nature, the offending nature of man. This love was manifested, but it cannot be comprehended by mortal man. It is a mystery too deep for the human mind to fathom. Christ did in reality unite the offending nature of man with his own sinless nature, praise the Lord. That is the human nature. What does human nature comprise of? A sinful fallen flesh, a fallen nature, a sinful nature, the offending nature of man. It pleased God to make he who was sinless to be a sin, to carry the sins of the world. Not that he was a sinner because he committed sin, but he participated in carrying the sin of man. And so it is a mystery too deep for the human mind to fathom. Christ did in reality unite the offending nature of man with his own sinless nature. Because by this act of condensation, he will be enabled to pour out his blood in behalf of the fallen race. And that is why the Bible says that he poured out his soul in Isaiah chapter 53. And in pouring out his soul, this was the secret of his mission so that many will come into truth and many will be ransomed from the sin that Satan had imparted to the world. This is manuscript releases volume 17, page 26. And so a right conception of the nature of Jesus Christ is so helpful unto us seen as the one doctrine of Christian system is the common denominator of other doctrines. The doctrines relating to sin forms the center around which we build our entire theological system. If our conception of sin is faulty, our whole superstructure of beliefs will be one error built on another, each one more absurd than the last, yet each one necessary if it is to fit it consistent with the whole erroneous scheme. This is by Richard S. Taylor. If we are to end right, we must begin right. Many, perhaps most of the errors which have protruded themselves into Christian theology can be finally traced to a faulty conception of sin. And a good house, if you will want your house to stand, then it has to have a correct and a right foundation. Without a right foundation, then your house cannot stand in the storms of life. To reason from a false premise is to start an endless chain of false conclusions. So here we see uh, sin, uh, the people who say sin is a nature. The false doctrine of original sin states that to sin is not a choice. We are born sinners. We will always be sinners. They, they take the nature of man as the problem. Hence, they charge the government of God with the same issues that Satan charged him, that the nature of man was weak and could not obey the principles of his government. Practical displayed in false philosophy of health, disease is caused by faulty genetics. Lifestyle doesn't matter because we have no choice in the matter. If sin is nature, then it doesn't matter even the health reform is not a message that matters to us. Examples, some, someone defending a transgression of the natural law. We are going to die anyway. I might as well enjoy myself a little while I am here. So the false premise of sin and it is nature, and this is founded in a false premise of the humanity of Jesus Christ will lead us into uh, concluding that sin is nature and not trans transgression. And then if sin is nature, then we will keep sinning because as we seek Christ, it is not our nature that is changed, brethren, but it is our mind. It is the renewal of these deadened uh, 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 faculties that we have. 
And then we go to the next thing, the unfallen nature. Saying that Christ came into the fallen nature. The false doctrine of the unfallen nature of Christ states that Christ did not need to overcome sin in the way we do. Therefore, we do not need to overcome. It was easier for him to not commit sin than for us. Why? Because he did not come in our nature. So if Jesus Christ did not come into our nature, why would he demand us to overcome sin in this nature? It is impossible. So it doesn't matter. This makes the death of Jesus Christ a sham. This makes the plan of redemption just a play. And these are the points that we should be guiding as Christians. Practical displayed in a false philosophy of health. It is perfectly acceptable not to live a healthy life in all aspects because we are not required to be perfect. You see how these erroneous foundations will bring us to erroneous conclusion. Example, a little one here or there, a few puffs of cigarette smoke, a little uh, propane bad for my health is not going to make me lose my salvation. God knows my heart. I am a good person. So nature is here being faulted. Point three, no perfection. The false doctrine of the imperfectability of Christian character states that we will never be perfect, striving to daily obtain perfection of character and victory over besetting sins through Christ is tantamount salvation by works. And so now it is not about righteousness by faith, beholding and uh, holding on the omnipotent power. But now, because Christ had a different nature and we have a different nature, our acceptance before the Father is our outperformance of the duties that we have been given and not by holding on to the omnipotent power. Practical display in a false philosophy of health, we can keep making unhealthy lifestyle choices because we don't need to be perfect. Fourth point, no sanctuary. How? No health reform. The false doctrine of salvation by justification alone said that we are saved and made righteous once and for all. We can then return to our sins because we are no longer under the law. And if we can go back to sinning, what is the work of the day of atonement where we are told that unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. It, it erodes the message of the sanctuary and the day of atonement. Practical displayed in false philosophy of health. All we need to do is to ask to be healed and we can get a pill, a high tech treatment, a knee replacement. It is, we can then continue living the unhealthy lifestyle that nine son out of 10 resulted in our illness. One saved, always saved. So the sanctuary doctrine is gone. I need a breathing treatment so I can get a text. Smoke. So, but uh, the right conception of sin, sin is a choice, point number one. And if sin is a choice, then we have a fallen nature. Then perfection is possible because you can choose. Your nature does not condemn you. It is your choices that condemn you. Number four, there is a heavenly sanctuary and we have an advocate and we are justified in the name of the son. The father accepts us through the blood that was shed on Calvary. And then we can live a healthful way. Our bodies are the temples of God. And so whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it, do it in the glory of God because our bodies are not our own. So to reason from a false promise is to start an endless chain of false uh, uh, conclusion. If we are to end right, we must begin right. And to begin right, we must grapple with the question of sin in its doctrinal significance. Then we may proceed to build a system of theology with confidence, knowing that our conclusion will be based on correct uh, premises. I pray that um, the, the Lord may uh, continue teaching us that we may seek the truth as hidden treasure and not accept the false charges that Satan has put on the government of God. And how do we start? When we start with erroneous ideas of the nature of Jesus Christ and the conception of sin, then we end on the false promise. And we may be serving God with sin, pianists of the heart, but if we are espousing these false and erroneous ideas about 
the nature of Christ and the nature of sin, then we may be assured that there is no victory over sin, there is no justification, and the doctrines that follow under it. May the Lord be with us and may he bless us as we seek him in uh, our daily life. I'm praying that uh, this uh, presentation may resonate with us, that uh, we may be able to hold on to what is right and discard what is uh, not, not right. And so the humanity of Jesus Christ really matters to us a lot. It is not something that uh, should be played around with. And I'll end as I started that uh, this issue of the humanity is important. Why? The humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. Christ was a real man. He gave proof of his humility in becoming a man, yet he was God in the flesh. When we approach this subject, we will do well hear the word spoken by Christ to Moses of the burning bush. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where on thou standest this holy ground. We want to receive from Christ and not from our own preconceived ideas. We should come to this study with the humility of a learner, with a contrite heart, and the study of the incarnation of Christ is a fruit fulfilled which will repay the searcher who digs deep for hidden treasure. And after we get this treasure, let us not sell for any amount, but hide it in our heart. As the psalmist say in Psalms uh, 119, verse 11, that uh, your word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you continue teaching us. And so, Lord, help us not to make idols of false premises in our lives. For these false premises only ends us on a faulty ground. I pray that uh, you may impress the things that we have learned and that your will may be done in our lives. Everything we say and everything we do may be for the glory of the name, in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.